Hi, everyone. My name is Will Anderson. I am the Restoration Projects Manager at the World Resources Institute, and it's really nice to talk to you today about the what, the why, and how of funding restoration projects of all sizes. We all know that land restoration delivers many benefits. On the climate side, along with conservation, it can provide 30% of the solution needed to slow climate change by 2030. It provides water benefits, can improve soil health, can provide food and forest products for people, and it can also provide a financial incentive and benefit for people. Our research shows that every $1 invested in restoration can yield seven to 30 US dollars in benefits. That's nothing to sneeze at. But at the same time, despite that opportunity, there's still a massive gap for conservation and restoration financing. A 2015 report from Credit Suisse said that there's a $300 billion a year shortfall. So with that opportunity, why is there that shortfall? We'll get into that a little bit today. First to say, you know, at WRI, we've been working on this question for seven years now. Um, we've published reports like the business of planting trees. We've worked directly with projects and enterprises through programs like the Land Accelerator Capacity Building Program. We've connected them to finance with programs like TerraMatch, and we've directly funded them through TerraFund for AFR100 and other programs. So I wanted to set the stage by showing that we have research and practical experience to back up what we're saying here today. Our main lesson, of course, no one's surprised, all projects of all sizes need finance right now. But depending on their size and where they are, they have different needs for finance. And one thing that's important is that ticket size matters. If you're a project that needs 50,000 US dollars or less, there's different financing options for you than if you're a project that needs more than $500,000. And the projects that are, have the hardest time attracting funding are those in the middle, the ones that receive 50 to 500,000 US dollars. And so today we're gonna take this kind of example, uh, this framework, and we're gonna run it through an example. And that is our program called Terra Fund for AFR 100. Um, it was an opportunity and a fund for us to fund 100 of Africa's top land restoration projects and enterprises that are locally led. We provided each of them 50 to 500,000 US dollars in grants and loans with our partners, One Tree Planted on the nonprofit side and Realize Impact on the enterprise side. And we've already started moving funding to the ground. When we launched this program, we expected to get a few hundred or up to a thousand applications in the two week application window. Instead, we got 3,200 applications with an average funding ask of $145,000 from 31 African countries. And the organizations had an average of nine years of experience working on restoration projects. That was astounding. As you can imagine, it was difficult to go through all those applications and try and understand who were the best to give them an opportunity to prove their worth and to get financing. But after a couple of months of work, we were able to, by May of this year, select our 100 projects and enterprises, only nine months after we initially did our outreach across 27 countries that are going to restore 20,000 hectares and grow 26 million trees. And you can see the geographical distribution of those projects on the right um, on the map of Africa. So of those 3,200 applications, how did we narrow it down? We used a very strict screening criteria that was focused on organizational health, on the ability of projects to monitor, on their ecological health and ability to choose the correct species on their community engagement. And we found that the vast majority of the applications were not quite ready for finance. And you can see that in the early stage organizations part of the pyramid on the left. We found that there were a lot of people who were developing, so were a little bit stronger, a lot that were aspiring, stronger still, rising and acting. And you can see here that the top three, the rising, the aspiring, and the acting organizations were the ones that we funded the most through TerraFund for AFR 100. And so you can see here, we looked at the portfolio, we broke it down, and we showed that 2,000 were not quite ready for finance. So either they were dreamers or they had just not followed the rules of the application. But most importantly for us, more than 900 applications had actually promise out of those 3,000 that we could potentially fund. There were 776 that kind of had some experience but needed more technical support and a good 120 that actually had a lot of traction and really could you know absorb finance at the scale between 50 and 500 thousand dollars which was very heartening for us and so today we're going to start by talking about that first part the organizations that didn't quite make the cut here but still need finance those small projects of less than fifty thousand dollars so these are young nonprofit innovators and early stage companies. Think of local organizations, cooperatives, those kind. They have little organizational infrastructure. They might not have great accounting. They might not have kind of a robust internal employee system. They might not even have employees. Um, and they need technical assistance to get access to finance. They might have traction in one area and they're looking to expand into other geographies. 
They might have raised money from friends and family, but probably not from institutional financiers in the past. And they need flexible finance to scale up their new ideas and models because they're trying things out for the first time. It's inherently more riskier than larger scale organizations. An example of where they could get funding is crowdfunding. You know, there's positives and negatives to crowdfunding. The positives are it's accessible to everyone. There's, it's quick and unrestricted funding that you can deploy very quickly. And there's solid existing platforms like Global Giving, you can see in the right there, that allow anyone to really create projects and get finance there. The negatives is that there's a ton of people out there looking for crowdfunding. It's really hard to assess the project quality if you're a funder based on crowdfunding websites alone. Um, there's high transaction fees on these platforms of 5% or higher, which really eats into the amount of money that donors are giving. It makes it harder deal for them. And there's little transparency after funding. There's often an ability to give finance um, and updates on the platform, but very little kind of robust monitoring data. Or small grant funds, you know about these. These are kind of like $50,000 grants or $30,000 grants given out to organizations. The positives for this is that they're low risk to funders. You can fund many of them at once um, because they're smaller ticket sizes. So if you want to fund a lot of organizations, it's easier to do it this way. You can invest in risky organizations and ideas from young innovators because you know that even if it goes wrong, you still won't lose too much money. But the negatives are that there are high transaction and processing costs. It often costs the same amount of money to process a $50,000 grant as it does a $500,000 grant. And so it makes it a little bit less attractive for funders to fund these people. Um, smaller sums are less useful for growing organizations and companies. They're often looking for a little bit more money than what they've had in the past. And so it makes it difficult for them to scale up. And it's hard to track impact of these small scale investments, or it's just not worth it because the investments are so small. You can't really invest in robust monitoring and evaluation. And what we've been doing is working a lot with these small scale projects to bring them up to the medium size levels, the 500 up to $500,000 ticket size. The Land Accelerator is a training program we've run since 2018 for entrepreneurs that restore degraded land. So for-profit businesses, but locally led ones. Um, we've done it in Africa. We've done it, we're doing it in Brazil now. We've done it in South Asia. We've had 5,000 applications to this program or more since 2018. So it shows that there's real demand for this kind of capacity building support. And we've directly supported last year alone 168 companies and given special attention to 45. Of those 45, they've each received kind of a small innovation grant, just like that small grant fund I talked about of $5,000. Um, and top applications in Africa actually have access to an even larger pot of money through Terra Fund, an initiative I talked about earlier that does provide loans for small scale projects. So you can see here that without capacity building, small scale projects often will stay at that small scale level. But once they graduate up to this larger level of medium scale projects, again, up to $500,000, they have a whole other set of challenges they face. These are more mature nonprofit innovators and growth stage companies. They have good infrastructure, but they still need technical assistance. So by infrastructure, I mean they know how to use accounting practices or they have you know, professional staff on, on hand, might have a couple here or there. Um, they have real traction in one, one or more areas and looking to expand rapidly to different communities or different areas. Um, they've experienced managing small external grants, so not just crowdfunding, but you know, grants given by organizations like WRI or Wintry Planted or loans but they still need flexible finance. <clears throat> they can't just take any finance because they're still learning, innovating and growing, um, but they can work with clear deliverables. So if you're a funder, you give them deliverables, they can, usually, they can usually deliver. And so what we've done with a lot of these organizations, what they're facing in their challenges are that they really can't get access to finance between 50 or $500,000. Funders either want to expand into big projects or they want to stay at the small level. Those kind of people, to get them up to big projects, it's more risky inherently because you're giving someone their first opportunity to prove themselves. And so what we've done at WRI is that we've created something called a revolving loan fund. How this works is that an entrepreneur is vetted by business experts and signs a contract. They receive a loan. They pay back a portion of that loan every month, just like a regular loan. Um, if the enterprise makes all payments on time and submits their impact reports, the final payments were given. So the interest rate is only 4% instead of the 20 or 30% interest rate a lot of these small scale entrepreneurs are looking at as they're trying to expand. And then capital, once it's repaid back, goes to other graduates of the Land Accelerator or other programs that are training these kind of entrepreneurs. So you can see how we're trying to bring them up the ladder, give them more information so they can graduate up into that larger kind of ticket size. And two examples here, Nguni Nursery. This is a great native tree nursery that we've given a loan to in South Africa, led by Sia Bolela Sokomani. It has 55 staff. They're planting 45 native tree species and grown 400,000 in the last two years alone. Um, solid organization. 
Exotic EPZ, it's a macadamia nut processing and export company in Kenya. They've worked with over 2,000 farmers in a distributed way so they can plant these kind of high impact trees on farms. They have over 145 employees and we're also giving them a loan right now. So in order, when they can demonstrate their ability to pay back that loan and to access finance at that scale, then it becomes easier to convince people <clears throat> to invest in these projects at a larger scale at 500,000 US dollars or more. These are the organizations you might hear about kind of more in the news. These are ones with a demonstrated ability to manage a lot of money. They have professional staff with organizational and technical expertise. They own infrastructure like trucks and tractors and, and greenhouses and can scale production of plants very quickly. They look for multi-year financing because they have that kind of infrastructure already. So they have to continue to maintain it and keep it up. And they often have traction across thousands of hectares, especially in places where land is more available like Latin America. Um, and they most importantly and crucially have the ability to track their impact and communicate success to funders, which is extremely important as organizations want to have longevity and consistency in how they receive funding. And so an example of this kind of organization is Wells for Zoe. This is an organization that is now growing 1.25 million trees with two funding initiatives, the Prices Planet Coalition and another 340,000 with that Terra Fund initiative I talked about. They have the ability to scale to up to 14 million trees because they work with a lot of communities, they've mobilized them and they have demonstrated success in the past. They're very responsive to questions, both their local and international staff are very involved and are always willing to answer funders or other partners questions. They're always monitoring and proving their success through transparent communications. And they're restoring an entire landscape by engaging communities, the governments, and traditional leaders. In this project, for example, they're reforesting mountain ranges that have been deforested by charcoal production. And so by showing the total impact of what they're able to achieve, that can inspire more and more funders to do it. Another example here is Symbiosis Investimentos, which is an organization in Brazil led by the, that man right there, Bruno Mariani. They want to restore 50,000 hectares by 2030 by growing 2 million native tree seedlings for reforestation projects. And how they do that is they invest heavily in research and development for native species that have been historically not invested in by the traditional forestry research departments. Um, they're rescuing genetic material of these native species to restore trees that are on the brink of extinction in the Atlantic forest in Brazil. And we've been providing them technical assistance to expand their seed collection, germination, cloning, and monitoring and communication support to get them the finance that they need to scale up their impact even further. And so the question often is like, okay, there's a lot of examples, a lot of projects here, but how do we build a real ecosystem for projects large and small? We got to start by creating a pipeline like we had spoken about there at Terra Fund. Where are these organizations? What are they doing? What's their capacity? We need to build up their capacity, like I said earlier, through programs like the Land Accelerator. We need to design and mobilize financial flows that actually work for these projects, and we can get in more to that later. We need to track progress with transparent monitoring. This is the number one question that funders ask us at WRI. How can you prove success? And then in order to scale up, we have to engage large investors, government, and platforms to scale. And so the example I'm going to give here very briefly is of AFR 100. We're entering into the second phase of this exciting African-led initiative. Um, we are working to develop a central system to register and monitor the capital and capacity needs of all locally-led projects, enterprises, and government agencies within leading jurisdictions, for example, the country of Ghana. And so what it does is that it does two things. It allows with the centralized system to deliver capacity development through programs like the Land Accelerator and other programs that partners are, are creating and capital through initiatives like AFR 100 and Terra Fund for AFR 100. That's financing and monitoring those shovel ready projects. And the idea is that we move people through this pipeline. So they start at the small scale at around $50,000 or less, and they move up so they're able to absorb million dollar tickets in the future. It's the only way we're gonna be able to meet demand um, for these projects is by increasing supply. And the only solution is locally led. And so through these registries, our goal, like I just said, is to take the aspiring, this is the current pyramid I showed earlier, to catalog those needs, to align donors into that registry, to show them that if you work with this pipeline, provide them technical capacity support that and direct finance, that's gonna enable them to scale up, that then we change the curve. We change the curve from this, kind of pyramid that kind of has a lot of people who are aspiring to a lot of fundable projects, projects that can really get, you know, create impact that's demonstrable and to move more and more people on this pipeline. And it's not an opposite pyramid because we want to keep a lot of people 
at that aspiring stage. We want to increase the amount of people in the pipeline and in the restoration industry while getting more of them financing and technical capacity support. And so you can see here a little bit of a preview of what this kind of registry system could look like for a country like Ghana. The ability to kind of catalog all these needs and requirements in one place to then finance them, monitor them, and create enabling policies and procedures that are going to help them achieve success within those jurisdictions. So that was a lot. I thank you for, for listening. Um, and you can see here, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me and the team that I work on, which is the TerraMatch team at WRI, um, at the email terramatch at WRI.org. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, my final statement will be that it's the perfect opportunity for us to invest in locally led land restoration projects. Let's not lose that opportunity. And let's, over the next UN decade on ecosystem restoration through 2030, invest in those locally led solutions and empower communities all around the world to restore their land in the most ecologically, biologically, and economically successful way that they possibly can. So I thank you and have a lovely day.